Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. I know people are rolling in. We, we ourselves are rolling in a little late, so um, sorry about starting late. But we wanted to get the show on the road here because we are so excited to have this panel to continue the conversation that began last night in the um, presentation for the award for the Highline that was given to the Friends of the Highline and the Highline last night. I think some of you were there last night, but we wanted to have another more focused occasion to talk a little more about the kind of variety of of uh, impacts of the Highline, anticipated, unanticipated, some that have been highly critiqued, some that have been highly lauded, depending on one's perspective. And we thought that we would take the opportunity to build on the knowledge of some of the very important actors who were involved in the Friends of the Highline to join us for a, a more informal discussion and conversation today about the Highline. Uh, so you notice we're not necessarily, we can still talk about the design aspects. We're really interested about the implementation aspects, the social, the economic, the, the political context in which the High Line was a project, that uh, how it became successful, and what it's changed and not changed in the context of New York. Um, today we have with us uh, John Altschul, who's the chairman of HRA Advisors and the Emeritus Chair of the Friends of the High Line and spoke a lot yesterday. Um, we spoke at our dinner last night, but he didn't get a chance to talk, so we were, we were going to be able to hear from you more in the public. Then we'll have the two of the co-founders of the, of the High Line, Joshua David um, and Robert Hammond. We also have with us Stephen Gray, who is the curator, along with Caroline Smith, of the amazing exhibit that's out in the lobby. And again, congratulations, Stephen. It's really great. It really captured some of the issues that I hope we're going to be talking about today as well. And then we will have a commentary from Belinda Tato, who is a faculty here and teaches. She was just explaining herself as a hybrid, teaches both in architectural landscape and urban planning and design. And she's a co-founder of Ecosistema Urbano works on public spaces and public parks. So let me just say that um, uh, uh, we sent around to the panelists a set of four prompts for them to think about, and some of them will and some of them won't, but I just want to share those with the audience um, because we were interested in thinking a little bit more, here they are, about um, the questions about the fact that in some corners, over the long period of time that the Highline has been operating, there have been some questions about its impact on gentrification and what are the kind of pros and cons of a major, wonderful prod project that's so successful that it brings so much demand and so many visitors that it transforms the space that it was intended to make for the local neighborhood. And as if you were there last night, there were so many, there's thousands of international visitors. So one are the sets of issues about the, the, how might they look at the project again in retrospect after seeing the, the changes that maybe they didn't even anticipate as was mentioned last night. Um, an another question had to do with the issue of the relationship between the High Lime and its surrounding neighborhood. It's, a, in a way, it's an iconic, globally iconic project that brings people from everywhere, but it started out as a project for the neighborhood. So that's another version of, like, how do we understand its successes, the pitfalls, as well as possibilities that projects like these um, produce for the local community that may have been the intended target from the very beginning. Uh, a, a third question had to do with how transferable is this model to other cities and other places because it is being adopted or the language of it is it being adopted in many different cities. And then another question about the transferability of the model of, of um, self-reflective activism and, and kind of the global learning that the Friends of the High Line have generated with their network and like just thinking a little bit more about, I can't imagine there are cons to that, but like the pros and cons. So we just wanted to kind of dig more deeply into some of the implementation and contextual uh, conditions that have um, made people want to take a position on the High Line. And then we will ask each of our speakers, we'll start with John, we'll go down, go down this way. I guess we're, I guess we're gonna go down the road th this way. Um, and then, We'll open it up for questions and answers because we would like to really make this a more, you know, robust discussion among ourselves. So, John. 
ask people five to eight minutes or so. You'll have a chance to speak more. Um, well, well, first, uh, let me just say it's always humbling for me to be on a panel with Robert and Joshua. It, it, it's been one of the great honors of my life to support the incredible vision and courage and, and intellectual rigor that they've brought to this transformative project. And, and uh, everything the Highline has become really is, is, is begins with them and has been curated with them. Um, let me, though, in the time I have, talk uh, about two really important aspects of context about the Highline. And the, f uh, the first has to do with really understanding the Highline as a post-9-11 event. And, you know, when, when I first became involved, which is still pretty early in the process, uh, we have to remember 3,000 people had been killed uh, in the worst act of violence that occurred on American soil since the Civil War, about a mile and a half away. Um, New York City lost 150,000 jobs, uh, more jobs by far than exist in the entire city of Cambridge. Uh, more jobs than exist in all of downtown Boston. Um, the city was forced in an act of immense vision encouraged by Michael Bloomberg to pass the largest single property tax increase in the city's uh, entire 200-year history. Um, we were a city uh, <clears throat> literally under siege uh, and a city that had seen much of uh, our most important jobs bleed out. There were questions about the survivability of our financial services industry, uh, given the shutdown of the trading platform uh, uh, in Wall Street, given the exit of the investment banks to what turned out to be uh, temporary quarters. Uh, so it, it, it's important to understand the context in which we worked in. and. When we look at the enormous economic and social rejuvenation of New York from the perspective of 2018, none of that was foreordained in 2002. Um, and the, comma of, the trauma of both the very real economic shock, which should not be diminished, um, and the emotional trauma of the community, which should not be diminished, uh, I mean, a, a discussion at that point in time about gentrification uh, would have been, I mean, it, it's not that we would have lost the discussion. The discussion simply wouldn't occur. Um, the question was the survivability of New York City as an economy. Um, so I think it's important to set decisions made in 2002 to 2005 in the, in the context of the trauma of a post 9-11 world. And, there certainly are, are, are greater and, and, and I would believe uglier contacts, uh, you know, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan. Um, so the country made huge decisions in response to what occurred on September 11th. The High Line is, is among those, uh, frankly, much more positive. Uh, the, 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 the second thing to understand is the High Line in the context of the deindustrialization of New York. Uh, the Highland is a piece of underutilized industrial infrastructure because the manufacturing economy had left New York. Um, we all view New York today as a center of, of technology, as a center of finance, as a center of creative industries. That is not our history. Um, the city of New York uh, is a, was for three centuries a great center of manufacturing and transport. Um, we made 98% of the garments worn by women in America. We brewed half the beer drunk in America. We fabricated 30% of the steel utilized in America. Um, we were the primary port of entry for much of the goods that moved into our country from, from Europe. Um, that economy began to die. And when it died, whole swaths of the city were left without economic function, including far west Chelsea. Um, there were literally 120 piers that lined uh, the west side. And those warehouses that were there were at the heart of a, of a very dynamic manufacturing economy. So the, the uh, 
far west Chelsea rezoning, in which Joshua was a member of the community board and wearing his highline, I played a very critical leadership role. Uh, you know, I would argue historically, the most important decision it made was for the first time in history to allow substantial residential development as of right in the neighborhood. Uh, it was not legal in far west Chelsea to build a residential building when the High Line was constructed um, or in the years before the High Line's construction. It simply wasn't legal. So the, the principal transition is the transition of an economically obsolete manufacturing zone to a vibrant residential neighborhood. Now, the people who came into that zone are very wealthy. Um, the effect of the High Line is empirically very clear, though. It, dif it displaced wealthy people by extremely wealthy people. Um, the people who would have moved into the neighborhood absent the High Line, given the underlying dynamics of New York, in today's dollars, let's say they would have paid $3,000 a foot for a condominium. Um, given the presence of the High Line, they're paying $3,500 a square foot for a condominium. The principal location of, of uh, people of color and people of low and moderate income, the Fulton and Chelsea houses, a magnificent, important remnant of our, the housing policies of the New Deal, uh, ensure that this neighborhood will remain one of the most racially and socially integrated neighborhoods of New York, about a third of the population. Um, that is residential there. Um, so what, what the Highline changed in terms of residential dynamic, given its location in Manhattan, was not the absolute inevitability that the market would come in and build housing for wealthy people. Uh, what it did was make a transition uh, between building housing for we very wealthy people to building housing for ultra-wealthy uh, people. Um, frankly, I don't, spend a, I don't lose a lot of sleep about that displacement. Um, so we took manufacturing space that would have been occupied by, let's say, people with an average income of five to $800,000 a year and replacing them by people with average incomes over a million dollars a year. Um, that's the displacement effect of the High Line. Um, now, there are broader trends in New York, quite painful, about our city's systemic inability to provide fair and equitable housing, uh, our city's inability to uh, meet a mere fraction of the requirement to keep the city racially and economically and socially diverse. Um, but that is a much broader question. Uh, it begins primarily with the extraordinary retreat of the federal government from the financing of lower income housing, uh, about which there's been a bipartisan consensus among both Republicans and Democrats for 25 years, um, which has crippled our ability as a city. Um, frankly, one of the reasons why New York has right now probably the most aggressive program of building low and moderate income housing uh, of any city in our country is because it has the tax base that allows it that freedom, a tax base generated by projects in no small part like the High Line. So um, I think issues of equity, issues of fairness, issues of our ability to house people uh, uh, of limited means who can't afford market housing in New York is probably the most fundamental challenge of our city. Um, I would argue that um, um, the High Line itself is a, is a reasonably small portion of, of that dynamic. And uh, had it, it, it been rethought at the time, were that possible, which I don't believe it was, the net effect would have been um, uh, uh, hardly of consequence on the character of the problem we confront as a city. Thank you, John. Robert. Um, so I'm going to just take our approach something sort of differently. Um, right now, that's something very top of mind. I was asking John's opinion when I saw him at, at the hotel this morning is, we are working on what is our mission, vision, values, and objectives for the organization, you know, for the next 10 years. And what's interesting, and just 
put some backstory on that. Uh, we never had a mission and vision when we started. <laughs> you know, we never wrote anything down like that <laughs> until the Highline was open for maybe five years. And then we did a mission statement, but we never even did a vision statement. Um, and partly the reason is because we all sort of had a vision of what we wanted uh, to do. And we, we, we didn't, and, and in some ways, I think if we had tried to put it on paper, it might not have been as effective. But in a lot of ways, it was to create um, you know, my personal interest was in design. It's appropriate being here. Um, and we knew to get this project done, um, to be a public-private partnership, it also had to create economic development. Um, so I think in some ways that is somewhat a gross simplification of our, and, and the advantage Josh and I weren't designers, uh, but we were interested in design, but we realized we, we didn't have to be the ones that decide what got built up there, that we, in the broadest sense, wanted the city and the neighborhood to decide um, what went up there. Um, and so now um, we're faced with a very different city. You know, it's basically 20 years later, and as John laid out, the city he described is not the city that we're living in. And, you know, our neighborhood is a I think a microcosm on steroids of what's happening in a lot of urban areas, you know, all over the country. So those needs have changed, and and how, what is our role in that? Is what we're you know literally struggling with. So there's these issues of social equity. So, but what role do we play? What we're not going to, as John pointed out, we're not going to solve the housing crisis, but you know we were involved in creating what, what is in our neighborhood now. So what, what is our role? How do we, where can we realistically um, have an impact? Um, one of the places that I think we can have the biggest impact is in this kind of conversation, because so many people look to the product project. Um, I think to John's point, I don't know what we could have done. You know, realistically, I mean, it's always easy to say we could have done things differently then. Um, I, there was a, I was reminded as John was speaking, there was a, a, a community, a long-standing community member named Ed Kirkland who was on the community board. And he was a preservationist, huge preservationist. He knew every single old building. And he was not, against, he was not for the High Line. And it was always interesting, because um, we were sort of surprised, I think, uh, that he wasn't. And basically what he said is he said, and this is when no one thought the Highline would happen. There was nothing. He said, if the Highline happens, it's going to lead to taller buildings. <laughs> and that was his. He wasn't concerned about necessarily affordable housing. He was just concerned about density in the context of older buildings. But, you know, again, we sort of thought that was sort of a crazy idea in some ways because this, this thing was so un unlikely. But, you know, it's interesting that he, he proved right. And whether you can, for, for better or for worse, um, the other thing that it made me think about, John, was the, um, the zoning, the fight over the zoning. So the Highline, and, and when we say West Chelsea, so on 10th Avenue, uh, east of 10th Avenue was residential, but west of 10th Avenue, where the Highline runs, was, was all commercial. And so Giuliani had wanted to, to, to rezone that um, residential, and he was just going to tear down the Highline. And, you know, I think that the vision was sort of a law, uh, of, of what happened on Sixth Avenue, these tall residential sort of boring buildings with giant bases. You couldn't build a giant base residential building with, with the High Line. Um, and so we knew it, it was going to be rezoned and what we wanted it to include the High Line. And it was in, there was three sort of groups that were advocating. There were people advocating for affordable housing. There were people advocating for lower density because they lived in a historic neighborhood and they didn't want taller buildings. And then there was us advocating for the High Line. And you know, now it looks, I, I mean, we, we're starting to go back and actually look at what happened. We felt like we came to a compromise, all three of us, uh, of three of groups. No one was completely happy with what they got. Mm -hmm. Affordable housing got lower density in the mid-blocks next to the historic district. Um, affordable housing uh, got um, what we thought would lead to about 30% of affordable housing if the neighborhood developed along the traditional lines and 
John can probably explain why it didn't develop along those lines. There are, I think, 700 units of affordable housing, housing that has been built so far uh, along the High Line as part of that. And what we got is we got the High Line saved, but there was no, because the density had to go down and the density that went up went a lot to affordable housing, what we got is no sustainable funding um, for we, we, a little bit, but not, not to sustain operating it or to build it. Um, so I don't, just thought, reflect, you know, go back, back to that uh, core sort of deal that created the High Line and sort of helped shape that, our neighborhood. So um, I, I, before the High Line started, and still now, I live about a block away from the High Line, which is how I originally came upon it. Um, and I lived in the neighborhood for nearly 15 years before we started Friends of the High Line. Um, and when I moved in um, in 1986, um, I guess that's 13 years before we started, um, I was a gentrifier then. Um, I was a white Ivy League grad coming into a diverse neighborhood that was still somewhat rough, um, who was following a group of people who'd come in to gentrify the neighborhood 15 years before I'd come in. So since, since the 1970s in Chelsea, various populations had been coming in and on one hand you could say revitalizing, on the other hand you could say gentrifying um, the neighborhood. So I think this, as we are seeing all across New York City and as we are seeing in cities across the country and around the world, this is part of an evolving pattern that involves many different forces, um, which are too big for me to encapsulate um, now. Um, but I just did want to point out that this is not an isol an, it's not an isolated gentrifying force in this in this community. Um, the other thing I think that it is it, to build a little bit on what both John and Robert had said, there were a, a number of very specific constraints on how we could go forward in bringing the the, the High Line project to reality. Um, we had underlying property owners that were pri private property owners um, who had the ability to keep the city in court in perpetuity and basically stop anything from happening ever. Um, and because of that, some kind of agreement had to be made between the city and the property owners to give them some value for the development rights that they couldn't build over, over, over the High Line. Um, and I think it's actually one of the great miracles of the Bloomberg administration that they managed to carry out, negotiate, I think there were 22 individual property owners under the High Line, that they managed to successfully carry out those 22 negotiations with very a group of very litigious property owners and come out as well as we did in, 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 in the end. Um, but there wasn't really, by the time we that the, the structure of those agreements came into effect in terms of how, how development rights would transfer, how they would be sold, how those economic models were set, there wasn't a lot of variability by the time we got to the end. It was either this arrangement or nothing, basically. You couldn't, I, I don't think there was any possibility of getting a, a any kind of deal that would have been different from the one that we got, that would have provided more funding for affordable housing, that would have had some other kind of financial underpinning than the one that we got. I think this is, I think we, there was an amazingly strong and positive agreement that came out of this, the, uh, the alternative to which was the High Line sitting there neglected forever or being torn down. Um, and that was just the reality of this particular context and the role of private property owners, real estate developers in the city planning process in New York City. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that I would also just bring to the table is coming in on a different subject, um, which is community engagement. Um, and I think from very early on, our organization really uh, elevated 
community participation and bringing in community voices into the planning process for the High Line, we, that was one of our top priorities from day one. <laughs> Um, we did learn to do it better over time, and we made some mistakes in the beginning that we learned how to improve upon as we went on. Um, I think that the, the easiest way to describe the, the, we, how we improved was in the beginning we really looked at community participation as inviting people to come to things that we were doing. Um, we would have meetings <laughs> like this, talking about the design of the High Line with a room of people that looked a lot like this room of people. Um, and and it was, we got very few participants. Um, and yet we felt we were reaching out and inviting people to be part of the process. At a later stage, um, when we found the resources to invest in expert professional guidance on community engagement at the level that we'd invested in expertise in design and and other 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 disciplines within the organization um, we reframed the way that we we worked with our community and and I think the transformative moment was when we did a door-to-door -door survey of residents in the low-income housing communities around us knocking on doors surveying people, person to person, um, and, and having those one-on-one -on -one dialogues um, on their turf to find out what, what their hopes and needs for a public space in their neighborhood were. Um, and I think that, that that process really transformed what we knew and understood about our relationship to our community and how we could be better neighbors and serve our neighbors well. Um, and I think it, I, I think it, I recently just got through uh, the first time ever doing door-to-door -door political canvassing, which I think is a little bit, is somewhat similar. I think there's a there's a feeling that you can send out emails or do social media stuff or do television advertising and you're reaching people. But there's no, there is no replacement for that one-on-one -on -one conversation if you really want to bring people in to the, the, into the process that you're working on. Okay, great. Okay, it was very inspiring to listen to all of you because, as you know, I'm a designer myself. So this is a very reference project. For, you know, for years we've been looking at the High Line in many different ways. I would like to make some remarks, and maybe a question for the table. Well, the first one is, am I, a, I am a designer, and I like this idea of being kind of the mediator between the community and between you know the the, the, the conditions and trying to you know to come up with solutions that really serve the community. But I sometimes encounter kind of some resistance among the, the designers community because people get like, oh my God, then the project is going to be so awful. So I like to, to, really, to really kind of uh, remark and highlight how important it is to actually determine and design that kind of framework that, that enables the conversation. I was working in France last year and it was very interesting to see how they understand the idea of participation that is always linked to information. So you cannot come up to a meeting and just people, what do they want to do? Mm -hmm. Because again, as you were mentioning, it was very difficult to find out or to come up with a solution that would make everybody super happy because there's a number of constraints, there's financials, there is you know a number of issues that has to be. So I think you know this idea of uh, I'm very intrigued about the process. The other thing is also the process. I, I very much enjoy this idea of having a kind of an open-ended project that would lead to many different possibilities. And I think it is interesting now to look back because I guess now it looks very consistent and very you know everything very coherent. But I guess there were so many bumps and so many you know so many difficult moments and I'm again I'm very intrigued about this kind of process but at the same time as a designer I always say you know I come here but I never have an opportunity to, to follow up so I think it is great to have this idea of how can you do a series of activities or whatever to you know to to figure out how to design and then how to follow up so you get a kind of the, the, the full kind of loop the whole process and uh, the other thing uh, that I'm very interested about is the um, you know the preservation concept I've been working in Ecuador for instance and we also found some resistance because there is this kind of very um, conservative approach to preservation in, in such a way that let's not do anything let's just preserve the infrastructure as a kind of a sculpture only the physical infrastructure and I like the, like the idea of linking this 
past with the future. And I always say there has to be a mm, generation, um, you know, kind of incorporating the, the youth into this kind of historical um, uh, interest. So I like this transition between the past and the future and how projects and how design can actually put history into value and not something just to be preserved and kind of encapsulated so that nothing can be done to it. I always say the most important is to get people excited about their history, not just um, something that can be observed from the outside. And then, um, well, very interested in the in the management. Like, you know, I, I would love to hear how difficult is the amazing or whatever it is uh, the management is right now because I, I you know I appreciate very much from the project I, I always look at the project only or mainly sorry and excuse me mm -hmm. from the design perspective because maybe that's that's what gets more publicity but I'm extremely impressed by the fact that it was such a you know you know, a complicated or, or, or exciting um, way of engaging different stakeholders in such a kind of a complicated. So I just wonder how, you know, just besides the past, how are you working towards the future and how can you make it very inclusive in terms of community engagement? Yeah, so I think those are some great prompts. I just want to back up a little bit to the deliberation process just to give folks a little bit of, of the backstory. Um, so, you know, the, the, the high line is complicated, and there were some of us on the committee, at least myself, I will say, um, who was very committed to selecting a great project, um, but also very committed to it not being the high line. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because the high line, the story that we know, mainly focuses on the design, and the critique that we know may, mainly focuses on the economic development that followed and these, these um, issues of gentrification, displacement, et cetera. And so as we deliberated, um, or as we were visiting all of the different projects and the different teams, uh, when we met with the Friends of the High Line, especially our conversation with Robert, um, it was clear that he was as uncomfortable with the things that we were uncomfortable with about the High Line, um, but that his discomfort was had led to um, projects and ideas and, in, and initiatives that were addressing those issues directly. And I mentioned a couple of those last night um, in my remarks, um, but I'll mention them again for those who weren't, weren't here. So the first that they noticed was that uh, when they first opened, uh, most of the New York residents that visited were not people of color. It was mostly white, less than a quarter of the visitors. Um, and so they have a robust public programming agenda, which is now almost $4 million a year. Um, and a large portion of that uh, public programming, programming agenda is focused on um, culturally specific uh, activities for communities of color, both on the High Line and in the communities surrounding the High Line for those who might not be coming onto the High Line to enjoy them. That was significant to us because it was a, an expression of the project having some self-awareness and those leading the project, having some self-awareness, and then projecting that self-awareness into a larger context beyond the definition of the site and the project itself. Uh, the second thing um, that really sort of, I think, captured my imagination was the, the Highline Network. And that was the, the fact that this was the, this network of similar adaptive reuse projects, industrial adaptive reuse projects, waterfronts, uh, railways, um, and highways uh, that are being rethought around the country and, and now around the world. Um, and an invitation of groups of these, uh, groups from leading these other projects to come into discussion with each other to both learn from the clever maneuvering and all of the sort of um, the, the, the happenings that led to the creation of and the implementation of the High Line, as well as the critiques and understanding how they might avoid pitfalls. They may be able to project, better project the success of their project and put mechanisms in place before things get out of hand. Um, but also for them to learn from each other, that it wasn't just you know the friends saying, we've done this great project, we think we can teach you something, but actually we've done this project, there are all sorts of things to learn from it. But we also want to learn from other projects, and we want other projects to have the chance to learn from each other. Um, and so 
that was the moment where we went from kind of a split jury to a unanimous jury. Um, and the story that we wanted to tell about the High Line um, in the exhibition um, and with the prize um, was very specific. So, you know, people may not know, but um, the, the, the choice to give the award to the Friends of the High Line was a very deliberate and, and deeply discussed decision because the, the designers of this project are very, are, are, you know, par excellence, and they're, they're amazing, and they're, have, they have relationships with this school, and the design of the project is at the top. Um, but we all know that. And so there were this, there's this other part of the project, the process that started long before the designers came on board and will continue long after the designers are gone um, that is being led by Robert and was um, founded by Joshua and Robert so many years ago. So we gave the prize explicitly to the friends um, as well as the, the award money. Um, and we also made the exhibition really focus on their story. So those are those may not you know you may not realize that, but those are very were very deliberate decisions um, that were also politically charged decisions in the context of the GSD. Um, so I I just you know want to now go back to maybe Diane's first question about you know as you reflect and as you think about. The, the successes and the over successes of the project um, and what that means. Are there any, any things that we can learn as we look at other projects or that you might have done differently or that could even retroactively be reconsidered? Um, so um, Joshua, you mentioned um, that the, you know, the negotiations that happened with these property owners couldn't have happened any other way. Um, and what you all may not know is that for CX, CSX Rail to authorize transfer of development rights to the city to make this a park and then trigger the federal government to release, to issue a certificate of interim trail use, which is a certificate that means that the rail can return to its use as a rail should it need to do so, um, but that in the interim it can be a park. For that, those two things to happen, for the park project to even happen, every single one of those property owners had to agree. If there was one holdout, the project was over. It would never happen. Um, and so when Joshua says it couldn't have happened any other way, it's, it actually couldn't have happened any other way. It almost didn't happen at every stage of the, of the game. Um, but then I have a question, maybe the question is for John. With the projections of the economic impact that you gave, which, which were, we now know were, were rather understated, but still significant, um, what was your calculus in not capturing more of that value, the, not, not the value from the negotiations with the, with the property owners, but the larger economic generation that was projected for the city within the area, either for affordable housing or you know now we're the the develop, surrounding developments generate almost 64 million dollars a year, 14 million of a year they raise and they like what 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 can we do or what could you have done or what would you have done or why did you do what you did uh, in that way? Um, we what we're going to do one because John had a question also of uh, Joshua and so there are a couple of questions on the table so we'll do one round through and then we'll open out to the audience but I do want to make a clarification as a chair of the committee <laughs> that we did give the prize too much. <laughs> the prize to the High Line but we oh, yes. we pulled out the we specified that the award money would go to the friends of the High Line. So, I mean, it's kind of both. It was not that we didn't give it to the Highland, we only gave it to the Friends of the Highland. No, 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 yeah, yes. And the second we gave thing the I want to say, and the reason that it's important to make that point is because I, it's ever clearer to me now after last night and today, but from the, even in our deliberation, that you can't separate them. Yeah. That in a way, the involvement of the Friends of the Highline is part and parcel of the design, et cetera. So I just want to make sure that that's the clarification here. So, John, we'll start with you a question and some responses. Uh, uh, <laughs> Let me try to quickly do three things. One, um, first of all, I want to say, just say to everybody here, the exhibit that Stephen curated is remarkable. I mean, I've seen 10 exhibits on the High Line, including the one done at MoMA. This is the most comprehensive. It's the first that treats the High Line as a design, as a social, and as a political entity. And it's just an honor, I think, for us to come and see that. 
and I, I just want to express my appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, now, let me say three things. The, when we're looking at issues of inequity, uh, the one that, that I am most troubled by are not the decisions made when we built it, though, though I'll return to that in a second. Uh, it's the enormous inequity of the operating model. I mean, every single park south of 96th Street of any size in New York is run by a private entity. They raise over $100 million a year privately. These parks, Central Park, Bryant Park, the High Line, Hudson River Park, uh, the parks at Battery Park City, Battery Park, are some of the most beautiful and well-maintained open spaces in America. Um, the park system that the rest of the city has is underfunded, poorly maintained, without capital resources, and deeply troubled. And the fundamental unfairness of, of, of shifting the operating requirement uh, so that some parks can spend you know, uh, uh, hundreds of dollars, uh, thousands of dollars an acre, and other parks scramble for peanuts is a painful lasting legacy of, of the financial uh, constraints upon our government and to have privatized operations. Now, under Robert and Joshua's leadership, I think we do a remarkable job of trying to make our space as, as, as open and equitable and fair as it can be. The most equitable thing would be to take the parks in the other five boroughs where low and moderate income and people of color live and upgrade those parks. Um, so I think it's very important to focus on the enormous, the operating model that we have is the only operating we could have had. The parks probably never would have taken on this park, never would have built it, never would have operated. But this, I think, requires, and what it's done is also take away the most powerful political constituency for funding, because parks that wealthy people use look fabulous. They are fabulous. And the parks that more disenfranchised communities have are not fabulous. Um, the, the second thing I want to say, which is really triggered by Joshua's remark, which I think is very interesting, is, is I agree with Joshua completely that the that, that, and maybe wholly self-interested, but the deal that we took on construction was the only deal we had. Now, having spent 10 and 15 years fighting bad ideas uh, in cities and winning some, losing some, the only counterfactual alternative to building the High Line was simply not building it. And I think if, 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 if I believe right now pretty strongly that if the idea of the hollowing was brought to our current administration in New York, they would not do it. And they would say both the capital dollars and, frankly, they would have said affordable housing is more important than public open space. And they would have created a zoning platform that allowed for larger format buildings that would have created a much higher volume of low and moderate income housing because a lot of the shift that Robert is referring to is a, just a, a, a physical property form that re virtually requires a condominium structure uh, as opposed to rental housing in many of the uh, uh, high-line abutting properties. It's just not big enough to make the economics of rental housing work. Um, so uh, if, if I don't think there's a world that is available in which you have the high-line and you have a robust affordable housing program, I think there's a world in which people could have said, let's just stall. Let's sue. Let's find a property owner who won't give in. Let's just stop this thing. And let's wait seven or eight years. Let's wait till a different administration comes in. And the pro most important <coughs> priority for Far West Chelsea is affordable housing. I think that's a world that might have been possible. And so I think. Uh, as, as somebody who tries to think about the overarching structure of, of political and policy choices in my city, I think there was a choice made that I supported and still am glad I did to build the High Line. But I, I think the alternative to that was not a different High Line, but no High Line 
and a robust affordable housing plan that I believe would have been obtainable if there had been an assertive strategy to simply stop the project uh, and wait 10 years. Hey, Robert, and then Joshua, and then we'll open it up um, to you. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think thinking would, what could have happened, I mean, what, what's more interesting to me is, like, what, what can people learn now? And to me, I think the thing that we've done um, that's most important is sort of make the crazy credible. The economic study that John did that helped convince the Bloomberg administration, I think the Bloomberg administration, <clears throat> even them thought it was a little bit crazy. Like, it would never create this much value. And so... <clears throat> that was seriously crazy. They thought it was seriously crazy. I mean, I didn't believe it. Um, you know, I always thought what John did is you take a lot of numbers and then you just say it creates this much number. You know, you have a big, like, sort of pad of paper with all the numbers. Like, I know, I know. Um, but but, he, but he's done, he says it very convincingly. Um, but... Uh, yeah. Um, but I think, so what, what, once you create the value, you can't take it back. And so that's, to me, the lesson for these other projects, that mayors that want, and, and cities that want these kind of projects is that want the tax revenues and all the, the benefits. You have to figure out what, where you want to put the value, because I think mm -hmm. that's now, if we had known, which no one could have believed, that we would create this much value, you could have potentially allocated it differently. Or that's my naive non-city planning kind of understanding of it. And so to me, that's, that's the message for other projects is, and, and what I see when people building these projects is they just want to get them done because they're so difficult that they just want to get them done and then figure out the, those issues afterwards. But I think that's what, I mean, I would urge them to do is look at that. The second thing in terms of the community input um, that I think the questions we tended to ask were design questions. That's what we were interested in. We were hiring a design team. They needed to design it. So it was questions about what are the uses up there? Where does the stair go on 21st or 20th? Is it Corten? Is it stainless? And for a lot of the community, uh, and for a lot of people <clears throat> in the community, those were fascinating questions and were really interested and engaged with us. We had dozens and dozens of community input that were pa packed, you know, with people that were passionately engaged. But again, a lot of the low-end communities, those, those issues were not relevant to them. I mean, they had other issues that were more important. And the questions we started asking after we opened were, what can we do for you? Not design questions. Like, what do you need um, that, that we could possibly provide? And the biggest, well, one, they said they hated our programs that we were doing. <laughs> so we had to, to give different programs, do different programs, but also as jobs. Um, and again, it, it's... It's, I think, these, and you see this now all the time, these projects that are happening, that they, they start out thinking they're just going to build a public space, and they morph into these organizations that are providing sort of some social services <laughs> more than just a traditional, like, maintaining the playground parks, so. I, I think we could open, open okay. questions okay. if you want. Okay, so why don't we yeah. open up to some mm -hmm. questions, and we'll probably have a chance at the very end to make final comments. Yeah. Um, we, Michael, we, did you did, did you want to open with a question? Does anybody want to start? Yeah. Oh, I want everybody to introduce themselves, please, Hello. when they when they ask a question. Hello, everyone. My name is Mikhail from Years, and I'm one of the low fellows this year here. Uh, first of all, congratulations with the amazing prize and your great achievement, and with the fantastic exhibition. Um, Maybe it's good also to admit I am one of the founders of an in initiative called Failed Architecture, where we look into the we shed light on the dark side of architecture. <laughs> and maybe it's also good to point out that your project is not featured uh, in our work. <laughs> and I think that's partly because of your ability to be self-critical and also to incorporate some of the lessons learned as you move along. So I also want to congrat congratulate you on that. Um, to your point, uh, maybe in zoom out a little bit uh, about equity and um, how your project relates to other parks across the city or across the country. Um, knowing that there are 1,700 parks and playgrounds in New York alone. Um, and I would like to maybe briefly talk about something which I would call uh, the winner takes all urbanism. So the kind of projects that attract all the intention, all the investment, um, and result in amazing things, but sometimes also at the expense of other projects. And maybe to illustrate your point, just last week we had someone here from St. Louis 
the alderman of the third ward. And we were looking into a park, the uh, fairgrounds park, and he was saying to the students who were like rethinking the park, I have a budget of $100,000 to spend on the park. <laughs> Which made me think also like coming to this lecture and I'm really bad thinking in miles. So I understood that the, the Highland is 2.2 kilometers long roughly, and it has cost $220 million. So roughly that's $100,000 per meter, so which is a yard, right? So just to put things into perspective. At the same time in St. Louis, there's the Gateway Arch, which ha has been redone, the landscape, for $380 million. <laughs> so my question would be not so much about the project as such, but more um, thinking about solidarity between spaces. How can you leverage some of the lessons learned, some of the resources that are generated through these uh, winner-take-all projects, how can you kind of share them amongst their larger body uh, of parks? Mm. Well, I'm really going to ask Robert to respond to that because he's really worked the hardest with the network and with a program in which the Highline provides services to other parts of the city. So I think it's probably a question you're better able to answer, Robert. Yeah, the mayor, our current mayor, started something called City Parks. Um, and CPI, City Parks Initiative, which was to focus on a series of parks that had been under-resourced for years. And basically asked, worked with all of the wealthy conservancies to figure out what could we do to help those parks. Um, and so each of us came up with sort of different ways of doing it. We're doing it two ways. One, we're working with a dozen um, community parks um, and gardens uh, in the Bronx that basically were just, they weren't even real parks. I mean, they were community gardens, but they had groups that wanting to, to do something. So we worked with them to figure out what could we do from a capital standpoint and help. We built greenhouses, we built fences, we built, you know, a variety of whatever they wanted that we could help design and build for them. Um, and then having our, you know, gardeners work with them on how, are the, how to maintain it. Um, the second thing is we, we have this national network of um, projects. They're all sort of, most of them are big projects um, or, or, you know, big, big, bigger than 10 million, bigger than 100,000. <laughs> but we started a, a local group of smaller projects in New York that don't get, some of them get some attention, but most of them don't get very much attention. And how could we all work together, again, to help each other, not learn from our lessons? Um, but really, all these things are ultimately a drop in the bucket. Um, because ultimately, even if we gave over, if we just sh closed shop and gave all of our money <laughs> to these parks, it would be a drop in the bucket of dressing it. So ultimately, for parks equity, the Parks Department needs to spend significantly more money. And, and you know, huge fan of the Bloomberg administration. Under the Bloomberg administration, they built a lot of parks. Most years, the parks budget, operating budget, was cut. So you were having more parks, but less money to run them. Yeah. But, I mean, this is really a mess. Because, I mean, let, me, let me tell you a story, which was a true story. There's a part of New York where I was working with a development project and we wanted to foster you know some widespread community uh, uh, goodwill and so we 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 the city it's a part of the city where the highest single rates of, of asthma among children in the city um, at a level which is an epidemic and so we said okay well, what we can do is is why don't we work with the Bloomer administration and, and let's let's put a million dollars in the budget for trees for street trees because trees are, you know, one of the things that really can help children with asthma. So we made this proposal, and we got completely trashed, um, and and we couldn't get any political support for it because the neighborhood said, "Oh no, no! If we have more trees, the price of our housing will go up, and we'll have gentrification." And we would rather have our children be sick than be forced out of our homes. Um, and we lost the allocation. So I think there's a, there's a real conundrum between investing significant amounts of money in creating 
amenities. Uh, and the wholly legitimate, very real and understandable fear that is pervasive in low and moderate income neighborhoods of being forced out of their homes. And they live in this constant tension between wanting what everybody wants for their home and their community and their children, which is safer streets and better parks and better schools, and the absolutely correct realization that if they get those things, they are more likely to be forced out of where they live. And so until we can create a, a long-term, stable, affordable housing system so that you can provide magnificent amenities, which all these neighborhoods desperately deserve, but then have them enjoyed by the people who are currently there, we're going to struggle with this, maybe somebody else, I, I don't know how to solve this tension between creating amenity-rich neighborhoods and providing stable, equity, fair housing. Can I it's make a comment before we open it up for more questions? Just kind of building on this, I've been thinking, um, yeah, so much great information. I, I just wanted, and I'm thinking about for us the, here at the GSD, faculty and students, uh, some lessons. Again, what, not so much reiterating what worked and what didn't, but like what are the lessons for all of us, not as we move forward. And I think there are pedagogic lessons and not just like policy lessons. But it strikes me, I mean, a couple of the comments. Uh, from my perspective, I frame this in terms of the fact well, two, uh, three things. First of all, I like very much this idea that projects come to be in a certain historical moment. And we have to, you, you brought that up with 9-11, and it's very important for us in a design world, a professional world of future action to understand that historical moment. And, under, and when we are looking in new places and with new projects, we also have to situate our own ideas, how they will fit, how they'll land or not land in a historical moment. So, and you asked a version of that mm -hmm. with preservation, but like history becomes very important to understand the successes and failures, possibilities and pitfalls of any project. I think the second point is that once you build something and maybe it's a historical contingency that made these actors come together and made that uh, compromise possible in that particular historical moment, the project has its own historical dynamics that are maybe affected by that project itself, but there are so many other things happening at the same time because history, like cities, are, are constantly fluid and changing. We have to be aware of that. In other words, we're not, we cannot be looking for one size fits all either planning or design projects that can just go anywhere mm -hmm. and do the same set of things. And I know that is probably obvious, but I see in this give and take on this conversation that there's a lot of self-reflexivity because of the understanding of how dynamic and I don't want to say unwieldy the project is because the city is that way and it responds to that. The third thing, and this gets back to your point, is that, let's be frank, you situating any wonderful design project or initiative, community initiative, in the market dynamics of a city, where if you don't have control over property values, there is always going to be some, some way in which this is kind of creates dis difference and change. And to me, I mean, in a, I, this is something, speaking to our planning students, I'm always saying, you know, Planning is not revolution yet, or you know, like the where, what is our project here, and what what can we do? We may like we want to may lay the pathway for the revolution, but it's we're not in the revolution. I'm not saying it's a reform versus revolution, but the point being that if we start thinking about the fact that any great project will have some impact on a market. <sighs> That requires us to work across our disciplines more. Mm -hmm. And that's why we gave you the project, because you worked across the disciplines, and we don't mm -hmm. do it as much, as much as we should here at the GSD. So any amazing design project should have some urban planning teams thinking about what will this do to property values and our other sectors that are changing in the city, and how can we start that conversation at the beginning to link them together, which is kind of what Robert is saying. But we can learn from your, your own self-reflective re learning and then insert that at the beginning of new projects. And mm -hmm. I do think it is really about the innovation and in design 
and thinking about what will that do to kind of re the regulatory property development, taxation, et cetera, context. And I know you guys work on that. The question becomes how we can do that here with through option studios, other sets of things, but how in the real world do we start changing the institutional structures mm -hmm. of decision making in cities that you can have conversations across sectors and specializations for every single project? So that's just to summarize <laughs> some of the things. Thank you. We'll have some more questions. Um, hi, my name is Harris Gordon. Um, following up on a slight conversation I had with Joshua last night, one of the models that could in fact serve here is the uh, Promenade Planté in the western area of Paris around Bastille, where the impact on the community has not been nowhere near as uh, severe in a way as we've seen with the High Line. You have a three mile um, similar project that has been in operation for probably about 10 years longer than the High Line, and you've not had the impact. What is it that makes the management of uh, Paris housing different uh, than we have here? Does somebody know the answer to that question? Sorry. So that's, a, I, I feel like, a slightly different conversation than the one that we had last night. And um, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll start by just re, re encapsulating a little bit what we said last night, because I think it was an interesting, uh, interesting point. One of the things that I talked about, for those who aren't familiar with what he's talking about, the, the Promenade Plante was done some 10 years before the High Line um, and uh, on a similar if older railroad viaduct in a more traditional French landscape architecture style um, and was a very important precedent for us as we were developing the Highline project because it made us look less insane because somebody had already done it <laughs> until we understood that people in New York don't really like to be told that we should follow what people in Paris do. Um, and so then we stopped talking about it. Um, but uh, one, before we, before we uh, finished design and started construction on the High Line, we, we went as a Friends of the High Line city representatives design team, design team group um, to Paris to meet with the architects and uh, city leaders who put that project together um, to learn whatever lessons we could from it. And one of the things that I came away understanding was a key difference in the entire feel of the project um, had largely to do with the way that it had originated. That was a completely government-led initiative, partly the, the city, partly the state structure, um, because properties were controlled both by both of those entities, um, that they developed it together and delivered it to the citizens of Paris as a, as a gift from the government um, versus the way the High Line had evolved as a citizens-led grassroots movement that required all sorts of public participation along the way, whether it was from the beginning when we were fighting demolition to later having these large open design conversations to later having to build financial support for it um, so that by there, there isn't the Promenade Plante does not have an impassioned constituency. People use it; it's there. It's a park. People aren't mad about the Promenade Plante um, the way that they are mad. I mean, like madly in love, um, and the way that they are about the High Line. And I think that has a lot to do with the the movement that grew around the High Line as Robert and I and all of the friends of the High Line were doing this, which was by the time we got to opening day, we had a constituency in our neighborhood, across the city, around the world, of people who'd come to have a sense of ownership in in the park and think it was theirs, they were a part of making it, they were invested in it, they were excited about it, so that by the time you got to opening day, there was this huge constituency of people who were in love with it in advance. Um, the So that I think that is one uh, interesting difference. Um, the way that the French government handles housing policy versus the way that the U.S. government ha handles ho housing policy, that's out of my pay grade. So maybe, I don't know if somebody else has, has some something to say about here. it. Jeanette. I'm actually, I'm just actually extending. Mm. Uh, just wanted to build on that, um, mainly because I, I, I live in Zurich. I've been living there for nine years. We have a similar project that was finished probably yeah, about eight years ago. 
uh, yeah, I'm part of the, the jury that selected uh, this project. And, um, and the viaduct in, in Zurich is also, in some ways, I mean, it's a tremendous amenity for the city, but very low key. And part of that has to do with something that you alluded to, which is the way in which these public projects are started, the way that they're uh, you know, essentially public projects in the sense that they were funded by the city, given by the city, and there was not much fanfare. Uh, I mean, it's a, go it's a good design, but it's not, there, there didn't need to be fanfare. And I think in a, in, a, in, a publicly, in a privately initiated project, you need an iconic design in order to, to give it that momentum, to push it through, and to have the entire sort of um, public behind it. And I think that actually probably, you know, in, in a lot of ways, um, gave it the success also that it has today. And in, in the fact that um, it wasn't just about you know people, of course, there was the kind of people, the, the, the constituency that was impassioned about it, but it was also the design community that was impassioned about it. It was you know the government that was impassioned about it because it was going to be something that brought value and uh, in, in a very different way. And I think that um, these, in, in, in countries where the, the kind of public institutions are providing for it, there's no question about that. You know, the, the, the design didn't really need to be uh, at that level where it would be iconic to be recognizable. Yeah. I th I, it's both level, but it's also purpose of design. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the promenade planté is, a, you know, a very traditional bourgeois French landscape, and it brings with it all the beauty and the baggage of, of, of that tradition. Um, you know, the High Line was designed to be a, a park that was seamlessly connected to urbanism, which is about as radical a rejection to a French garden as you could create. And a lot of the just magic and joy and popularity is something I think it's very hard for many people who walk the High to, to, to articulate. But their joy in being in beauty and landscape that is connected to city and not the Olmstedian dichotomy between city and open space and certainly not the French one. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I think it's, it's one of the, the things that, if I had to put words in Stephen and Diane's about, about why this prize was warranted, one of the brilliance of the design is I believe it was originally set out, as Robert articulated and I helped formulate, as an economic development tool and stimulus. However, because it is what it is, it can be transformed into a much more forceful driver for inclusion and equity and social integration. And to me, one of the great tests of the design, like all timeless great urban spaces, is its use and function can, in fact, in a way a French garden can't, evolve to very different social purposes that are defined by very different eras. And part of the genius of the design that Liz and Rick and Jim and Lisa came up with was the ability of, of, of it to adapt to different economic and social purposes given to it by the custodians of the space. Just to um, put a couple more words in my mouth. Um, so the, the, the impact that the High Line had economically was absolutely central to a lot of our conversations. Um, but it was one of the things I think that was the most problematic. Um, so it wasn't, we didn't give the award to the High Line because of the economic impact, but I would say not in spite of it either, um, but it led us to, to asking questions about how we measure success and what we value in urban design. And is, is ur great urban design urban design that has to generate economic impact? And if so, does that mean there are parts of the world, there are countries and continents that may never register to the level to resonate and get an award like this from the GSD? I have uh, one response to that, and I think you know maybe others have, I'm guessing others. Um, but I think to me, um, when we started this project, Robert and I, we weren't looking at 
economic impact as one of the drivers of why we wanted to do it. Um, and it became, um, it became a key strategy in getting the project done. That was, that was the argument that we had to make in order to get it done in the context of the city that, that John described in our opening remarks with a, a city in great financial distress. Um, the economic rationale for the park just had to be there. That became sort of a mandatory part of the strategy of carrying it forward. That said, if you go back to the very early inception days of when Robert and I first started the project, I venture to say for Robert that we weren't thinking of how to increase tax revenues for the city when we wanted to to, to make the highlight. <laughs> um, and I think it's it's become, for all of the reasons that John has articulated, it is a benefit. It, it is a substantial benefit to, to the city of New York that it does generate those revenues. But to me, the highest bar for success is the social dynamic of the space. Um, that is what is the is for me the marker of success. What is the quality of human interaction in the space? To me, it was an empty space when we started out. There weren't people up there, so the vision was get people up there. But what 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 does that mean? And um, you know, I think I always had a, a one of the one of the pieces of my vision originally was the Italian passeggiata, this evening stroll that everybody takes in certain towns in Italy, where you go out and it's the whole city coming out and having some kind of civic interaction in in the public streets. Um, and I think it's evolved a lot. That's just a very sort of base nugget of it, but the quality of public space, the way, the ability of a community to come out and inhabit it in an authentic way um, and in a way that showcases the unique social dynamics and cultural vibrancy of a city, to me that is the, above all else, the number one marker of success. I would just comment in, in Stephen's remarks, as, as somebody who lives in the intersection between you know, finance, urban design, and urban politics. I think now it's less a debate about should we move away from economic impacts to a, a very necessary transition from looking at aggregate economic impact, how much gross tax revenue I'm creating, how many jobs, to a distributional economic impact. You know, how is the economic impact that this park is creating or this intervention creating being shared fairly and openly by different communities, different neighborhoods, uh, different races within our city? Mm -hmm. So I'd argue economic impact should remain a very important driver, and we need increasingly to focus on distributional impacts and not aggregate impacts. Um. People, you have hands up, but let me we'll call on you next. But I'm just going to pick up on that too. I'm, I'm, I'm like on. I don't want to say I'm on both sides of the fence, but I, I, I actually like the your comments, Joshua, about not the kind of the economic development benefits were a part of the the framing strategy. Mm -hmm. And again, sorry to bring this home, like these implementation questions that sometimes designers don't think about are really become important to create the groundwork to do the design that you wanted to do. So I think that's really important. And ultimately, I would say, and I'm speaking for myself, although we had robust conversation on the committee, the issue of the economic success of the Highland was very little in our, in our discussion about it. Because there are a lot of projects that bring economic revenues to the city that we would not have considered at all as a project because it is an urban design project. That's good all well and good for cities to have funds and if they have a more redistributive government, even better because then they can distribute it and solve the other problems. But what I think is really comes through in this panel today, yesterday a little bit, is, and I don't want to just say quality of design because who knows, like what does that mean, right? But there, the issue of the flexibility of the design, you, somebody used the word flexibility, how it can be, um, Incorporating, incorporated different types of activities over time. You, I guess you did made it and compared to the French gardens. 
that's that's both the innovation of this design and it's it's a marker of the time we live in. We're kind of in a, in a po postmodern period where things are changing rapidly to have a design that's flexible and can be mute, mutated to respond in the day, in the season, and over the years is a very important part of the design. It came through in the presentation last night. The, the second thing that I would say is that, um, again, the, the paradigm shift of thinking about this kind of green space and public park space that is as much a space of urban, urbanism as it is a space of nature and it maybe is not the first place that has done that, but the, somehow the juxtaposition when you're walking on the High Line, when you're walking through the grasses and you've got this skyscraper hot, you know, all around you, there is a, there's a different experience and it's a different paradigm in the field. And that's, I think, also part of the exceptional design. Mm -hmm. And none of that would have been possible without the strategy, the political strategy, to do the deal to get, get it done. So I think that if we kind of disaggregated it over time and in its elements, we would understand why it's still mm -hmm. so resonant and gets more powerful as an idea as the years go on. So... We have a, a question there. Yeah, we've got three more questions. Why don't we, do you have a question? Why don't we take all three questions and then we'll let people end up because it's 124, yeah. Thanks, uh, my name's Doug Brown. Um, I'm with a local nonprofit that works on um, uh, building connected public spaces. And um, I feel lucky that here in Cambridge, we have a lot of design resources available to us, very world-class resources. But one of the things that honestly we struggle with is that those resources are more interested in working on projects in Sao Paulo or Shenzhen or in New York than they are on the local project. And so I guess my question is, if you were to go back to 1999 when you started, um, how'd you do it? What was your secret for convincing people that your project was big enough and crazy enough to be of interest, but not so big and so crazy that it was never going to happen and they should stay away. Um, <laughs> thinking basically as a community activist, not as a designer or now a manager, I guess. Yeah, I'm, one of the things that... We're, gonna, oh, we're oh, just yeah. going to pile t two more questions, I'm sorry, because yeah. that itself yeah. could take 20 minutes right to answer yeah. that question. Right here, right here. <laughs> yeah, right there, yeah. Um, Hello, uh, my name is Pancho Brown. Good name. Um, not related. No, uh, and, uh, for, um, master's in design here in critical conservation. And a question to Joshua that uh, you've been in New York for a long time. Um, you've seen the change, especially on the west side. Um, one of the most interesting things about the, the work of the art in New York was it's always haphazard. It happens in the croonies in the city when nobody was looking. And one of the things that I noticed about New, uh, the High Line is like all the way from the design to the new program is highly programmed. Everything has a place. Everything has where you see it, where you stay, where you're like, the whole design is very programmed and the whole art program is very programmed. And you having so much knowledge in the art in New York and how art has developed what, what kind of strategies will you do, have you have done to have space for the, for the good old New York haphazard in terms of art, you know, the, the graffiti culture, the, the, the amazing pop-up art that was happening, you know, the, the gay resistance, you know, all of that art component that was related to the own program for such a highly programmed space. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there one more question? We'll take one more. Uh, two more, quick. Because we, people have flights to catch, and you know, hopefully. Oh, I'm really. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. I'm Carrie Ronisal. I'm a master in landscape architecture um, student here, and uh, I'm really interested in the history of the High Line as a queer cultural landscape. And um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how it has impacted uh, queer populations in New York and um, some of the criticism it has garnered in maybe like a subsequent loss of that culture and like where you might be thinking in the future and how to like bring back that identity and just, yeah. Great, thank you. And the last one back there. So, yeah. And then we'll let everybody make thank comments. You. My name is Veronica. I'm a second year MAD student. 
Uh, my question was to John. I was wondering before the project was possible if there would be, if, it, if it's possible to briefly mention the key elements used to assess the future economic value, and based on the highline um, success afterwards, if, it's, if it is specifically possible to um, quantify the, posi the positive economic uh, spillovers that could potentially inform the monetary estimates from design value creation. Okay, so oh people get a chance to, oh well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, who's, yeah, which end are we starting out? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, 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 okay. Josh, you okay, Josh, you go, yeah. Uh -huh. um. <laughs> well, and then there's the un there's the, also the unprogrammed, like the the flex yeah, the real flexibility, yeah. not yeah. program yeah. flexibility. Um, so I'm not sure I have a great answer on the the queer culture qu question, although it is a subject of great interest and importance to both Robert and I and a lot of people at Friends of the High Line. Um, and so I think we we I, I don't know where Robert is now in programming and thought about this particular um, this particular dynamic. Um, but I think you know it does it the structure does connect three legendary gay neighborhoods in New York that have evolved sort of following the High Line from south to north, Greenwich Village, Chelsea, and uh, 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 up into Hell's Kitchen. Not because of the High Line. But not because of the High Line. It was just another another sort of demographic, demographic shift that happened independently. Um, and I think one of, you, you know, the roots of Roberts and my knowledge of the structure and part of our interest in the structure really does grow out of the gay environment in which it sets down its big, heavy steel columns. Um, and so I think there's, you know, we, we, we had a, 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 a moment of debate, or not, not internally, um, but with the forces around us around um, the Folsom Street East Street Fair, um, which for those who know what that is, there's a Folsom Street Street, street, uh, street Folsom Street Fair in San Francisco, which is a uh, highly leathery, sexualized street fair. Um, and there's an East Coast version of it that typically had happened in the meatpacking district for many years, was basically pushed out of the meatpacking district because of gentrification, not High Line related, in the meatpacking district before the High Line. And it went up to 28th Street on a street that goes underneath the High Line. Um, and a conflict began to arise, again, not because of the High Line, but because residential buildings started to get built on 28th Street. Um, after the presence of the Folsom Street street fair there, the residents came after the naughty street fair. Um, and then those residents, as residents tend to do as they come into neighborhoods that they should have known more about when they bought their apartments, um, <laughs> proceeded to be up in arms about the fact that there were half-naked men in leather spanking each other out on their front door, uh, front doorstep. And there was, there was when, when this all was fine and separate from us until we opened the section of the High Line Section 2 that crossed this street. Um, and it became a public question to us from certain r muckraking newspapers in particular of were we going to tolerate this, this display under the High Line and how could we have the public on the High Line exposed to such a thing and weren't we going to weren't we going to oppose it? Um, and we took the opposite stance and set up a booth down at the fair and <laughs> signed up members um, at the at the Folsom Street Fair. They were there before us. They were bef there before any of it, and they were part of the um, part of the community of the neighborhood. So I think. It is a history that is like the industrial history of the neighborhood itself is disappearing. Um, it's still there, but it's much less less visible than it was even when Robert and I moved to the neighborhood. Um, and I think it is an important el historical con context element of of the High Line. And I think you know just I. I look at many different aspects of the High Line itself and the organization that we created as having a, a questioning of authority, a transgressive quality. We, you know, we sued City Hall. We went again. The, the structure crosses the street grid in ways that no other structure does. It is essentially in friction with a whole bunch of established belief systems in the city, and I think that's a, that's an important. Um, important dynamic of it. Um, and so I 
think both Robert and I are interested in ways that 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 piece of the 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 structure structural uh, textural historical texture um, and current day dynamics now coming up to the fore more than ever because of the pol the political moment that we're in. Um, I think are very important to rise to the I, mean, I, I think someone, the study of queer and industrial space, I mean, it's not a coincidence mm -hmm. and it happens everywhere of industrial, you know, look at Berlin, look at, and so, and in the preservation movement and, and you know, there's a great book about gay men and preservation of Victorian houses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fast, I feel like it's an area that hasn't, people don't want to connect them for mm -hmm. some reason, so. And, and on the on the programmatic question, I think you know I think that in, in a way I'd like Robert to address part of it. But I think it's I find it interesting that when I when I find the High Line coming up in in writing, and the writer is taking a critical perspective on it, one of the words they often use is curated. Um, that a curated public environment is somehow there's a negative connotation to it being curated, which I think is, I don't have an answer to that. I don't have a yes, I agree, no, I disagree um, point of view on that. But I think it's an interesting thing to point out. It is, it is a park with a very specific set of operating needs that go along with it. And those operating needs and safety issues and traffic flow issues and do tend to, I'm not there anymore, this is Robert's problem now, but <laughs> does tend to make you a control freak. Um, you know, I, you, you're, you want to control things because there's, you know, particularly in the beginning where we were really concerned of anything bad happening. You know, everybody had laid out these elaborate tales of people flinging other people off and they were going to throw babies off and they were going to throw frozen turkeys. turkeys down on cars and there were all these terrible terrible things that were going to happen on the high line once it opened and so that did that did sort of just elevate a certain <laughs> sort of desire to control everything a random um, just one opponent a property owner fought the high line because he was worried that people would throw things at transsexual prostitutes on the street. And so he was wanting to save their lives by staring down the High Line. Was it? Yeah. But just for the record, I, I, I would just like to be, uh, the High Line didn't make Robert and Joshua control <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 The High Line is the High Line because Robert and Joshua were control for when it started. <laughs> but but, but so, so let, let, let the, the record should be, should be clear. I, I, in, in a more serious vein, I, I think that you know, we've talked a lot today about the legacy of the High Line, and and for me, uh, you know, Diane very appropriately because it has talked about big historical transitions, and certainly this debate exists because the High Line came about almost exactly when a you know 60-year-long hollowing out of the American city stopped and was reversed mm -hmm. into this massive wave of reinvestment. And, you know, these are, this is not a one year or two year form of chance. The Highline occurs at one of the most fundamental changes in the underlying economics of American urbanism of the last 200 years. And so, uh, this need to transition isn't a market cycle question or a recessionary question. It, it's about one of the most massive shifts in capital allocation in American real estate that's occurred in the last hundred years, that the High Line really happened right at its epicenter. But I think the most important legacy, and, and, and our founding chair, Phil Ahrens, has talked very eloquently about this in the last uh, couple of weeks, it really is the power of citizens coming together to know what is right for them and their community at that time. And I think the most important legacy I always take away from the High Line is that, you know, the government of the city of New York had a vision and it was disastrously wrong. Um, and a group of citizens came together and had a radically different vision. And <clears throat> due to a combination of their brilliance and skill and tenacity, 
due to the extraordinary openness and generosity of Michael Bloomberg and Amanda Burden uh, and, and, and the leadership of our government. Um, but it, it only happened because of the willingness and confidence of citizens to come together and set a vision and a, and, and, and a future for their own community. And that's what's, that's the only thing that, that, that made the Highline possible. That's the only thing that, frankly, makes this debate possible and only makes this tension that the committee, I think, very elegantly recognized, affirmed, and critiqued at the same time, it allows that tension to infuse the future of the Highline because it remains a place that is anchored in the future of its community and the issues that confront the future of this community are fundamentally different than they were 20 years ago. And because we have that accountability structure, because we have that value, uh, we as an organization have to lead a response to a very different set of human and community needs that were there than when we began. Beautifully said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just makes me feel so honored that we had all three of you here another yeah. uh, for another couple hours today. It was a great event last night. Today was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank we you. really. Thank you.